Is Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's painful journey since leaving the royal family catastrophic for the royals? Plus the latest in Meghan's legal battle and her half-sister Samantha gears up to release a tell-all book. How could it not be negative? It's called The Diary of Princess <laughs> Pushy's Sister. We get an inside glimpse into Kensington Palace as Kate and William speak to frontline workers. When you see so much death and so much bereavement, um, it's, it does impact how you see the world. Plus, creative director for Megan's Mirror, Christine Ross, helps us break down Megan's evolving style. And I would love to see her continue on this kind of accessible, down-to-earth, California girl path, because as the world has changed, there's not a lot of places for, you know, formal dresses and things like that, but there's apparently a lot of time for sweatpants and, and you know, jeans and comfortable clothes. We've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hello to our fellow royal lovers and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that's Molly, the host of the Diva Behavior Podcast. Hi, Molly. Hi, Christina. How are you? Doing good. How about you? Pretty good. I'm excited to get into some of this lawsuit drama. Oh my, God. Oh my it's gosh. Like all unfolding as we are filming this right now. So um, it, we got a lot to get to and a lot to break down and we'll do our best to, do, uh, to break it down for you. But before we get to the, all that, let's check in with our royal viewers, our royal watchers who had a lot to say about last week's show. We're going to kick it off with Daniel who says, personally, I don't think there will be much drama with the royals this year, but I think we'll see a lot of projects. Well, judging by this lawsuit so far, we are already starting with some drama. I know. Daniel, have you met the royals? There's <laughs> always drama. <laughs> always drama. I mean, there will be definitely a lot of projects, but I think there will be some drama because, you know, we're expected to see William and Harry um, meet up, you know, during the summer for the Trooping of the Colors, if all goes well. But, you know, there's always this this drama that the media stirs. <laughs> yeah, always. It's better than an episode of The Crown, I would it's say. Seriously, seriously. All right, Pradika says, listening to the comments read, it sounds like people are unable to separate his family from the firm. Employers have rules. I don't leave my job and ask them if I can keep my benefits and the company car. I don't know why there has to be a review either. That is actually a really good point. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is a good point yeah. because, you know, they said things are done a certain way and mm -hmm. they aren't going to bend and that's why they left. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can't expect to still have your benefits if you decide to leave a job. So that's, yeah. that's what they did. So, all right, next one goes to... Next one goes to Raquel says, the problem with Megan and Harry is that they are quite boring. They need the royal stardust. I mean, I think some some would say that they're boring. Some would say that there aren't. I mean, a lot of our viewers said that they absolutely love the podcast and some said that they didn't. They thought it was kind of boring. I guess it's whatever your preference is. Right. I think I agree the podcast was boring to me personally, yeah. but I don't think Megan and Harry are boring. That's why they are like one of the most written about couples in yes. the world. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're clearly not boring. They're clearly not boring. I mean, we, we talk about them week after week and and you guys talk about them week after week too. So clearly, you know, there is definitely still some interest in Harry and Meghan. 100%. All right, let's move on to our Royal Roundup, our Royal News of the Week. And let's kick it off with Duchess Kate and Prince William, who took some time to speak to frontline workers about bereavement support and how many of them are coping during the COVID-19 pandemic. Take a look. But what is it about the service that's really helping you at the moment and, and, and work through your feelings? Thank you. Um, it's just... But she just listened and she told me it was okay that I was feeling the way I'm feeling. You know, it seems like they do this week after week, you know, kind of talking to frontline workers, which is super, super important. But this was um, a topic of bereavement and how people are coping with death during this time, which so many people have been going through. Right. And William sort of opened up about something we don't hear him talk about much, yeah. which is the years that he spent as an air ambulance pilot. He said that he was so surrounded and he didn't say I, he said when you were, he really did a good job broadening it out to the frontline workers he was speaking to. He said, when you are surrounded by so much sort of illness and death, it can stick with you for weeks and it can make you see the world from a darker place. And I just feel like we've never heard him speak in such plain terms about it before. Yeah, and it was really interesting. It is. That's so true. I mean, unfortunately, he's had a lot of tragedy in his life and I'm sure it makes him see things in a totally different way. And it's good for a lot of people to relate to because a lot of people are going through the same thing right now. So they're definitely, you know, taking their time and, you know, speaking to a lot of people. And I think it probably lifts some spirits along the way. Yeah, definitely. 
All right, well, let's move on to Megan's legal battle. So like we said, this is a lot to unpack. The, uh, Megan's attorneys um, were in court this week arguing for a summary judgment, which means they would get a victory without a need for the trial in their case against the mail on Sunday. Of course, this has to do with the letter that was published um, by Thomas Markle that Megan wrote to him um, after their wedding being like, you know, please stop talking to the media. So it seems that the judge signed a petition to make Thomas's statement public. And there's a lot in there that he kind of, you know, says, he says basically everything. This also goes to the truth about Megan article that people magazine ran a couple, um, a couple years ago, or I don't know, a couple of years ago, a couple of months back where some of her close friends came forward and spoke as well. Right. So what's been going on with that People Magazine article is so interesting to me because Megan's side has argued that she had no idea that that was going on. She had no idea that her five close friends were speaking to People Magazine. Mm -hmm. But then the defense side has argued that she had to have known. And just with the way that things work with being friends with someone who's in a high position in the royal family, if you speak to the press without their permission, you are blacklisted from their life forever, pretty much. And not only did these friends reveal super personal details about Megan and the way that she feels about her father that they could have only gotten from Megan, mm -hmm. they were also identified as an athlete, a well-known this, a well-known that. So like anyone who follows any like blind item web website could figure out who the friends were right and she seems to still be friends with all of them yes she seems to still be friends with all of them and they also she they also claim that they really had no idea about finding freedom either so there's and there's a lot of things kind of uh going on there and megan ba basically says in this lawsuit you know i wrote this letter i have copyright um to it because it's my letter i wrote it well thomas is saying well she gave it to me it is mine to make public if I wanted to. So in his statement, he's saying that he was shocked what they said about him in the People magazine. And he why he came forward to the Daily Mail is because he wanted to change the misrepresentation, misrepresentation that was um, shown of him in this magazine. And he felt that Megan knew what was going to be published. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there are two very, very different sides of what the point of the letter even was. Because yeah. Megan's side is sort of arguing that it was an olive branch, right? And something right. that she wanted to repair the relationship with her father, while her father is saying that it was sort of just an attempt to tarnish his name and that it was always meant to become public because it sort of gave her side. Right. Yes. Yeah. This was story. her way of making a statement um, rather than going to the press or anything like that. She felt that, you know, Thomas would probably make this public. And he says that, you know, he, she never even asked how he was, never said how that she, the letter said that she didn't love me. It didn't even ask how I was. It showed no concern about the fact that he suffered a heart attack and no questions about his, his health. Um, he felt this was not a reconciliation and he wanted to go to the Daily Mail, which he said he was not paid to do to, um, you know, to clear his name. Right. And I think, you know, it's just, it, it makes me think that they're not going to be granted the summary judgment, right? With so these it, details. It doesn't seem like it. It seem you know, they, they've kind of been, um, they haven't really won in this case going forward so far. I don't think that they're going to get a summary judgment based on what we're hearing from Thomas, because this just really is a he said, she said type of situation. I mean, we can't prove that Megan, this was the reason why Megan wrote this letter. And we can't prove that, you know, this is why Thomas did this. So it, it is, it just seems like a case of a he said, she said thing. Yeah, I think it's just going to become something where they look at the exact letter of the law and divorce it from all emotion that both parties are putting forward. They're both making very emotional arguments. And I think it's the question is just, did she intend for that letter to become public? And did she own the copyright or did Thomas own the copyright? Right. And was there any copyright violation? And I think the other question that I'm sure the lawyers are going to be asking is, why do you sue the mail on Sunday for running excerpts from the letter, but not people magazine right. because yeah. they also ran excerpts from the letter. Yes. So that's something really weird to think about too. It is. That it's, I feel like we're going to see this go to trial. Like we said, this trial was pushed um, several months, so it's not going to happen until the fall, but I feel like we're going to, we're going to see them in trial. Yeah. And I think the most ironic thing is you're, you know, you're arguing for more privacy. You're arguing that your privacy was invaded and then 
you're kind of getting involved in this long drawn out trial where we're learning more and more and more about her private life. Right. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's just like, is the privacy the point or is controlling the narrative the point? Right. They're airing all their dirty laundry and you yeah. know, we're going to be front and center and we'll do our best to break it down each and every week. But while all this was going on, um, Prince Harry and Meghan, Mon Meghan honored Dr. Martin Luther King with a special gesture um, on Monday. And so what did the couple do? What did they have to say? Harry and Meghan on Martin Luther King Jr. Day decided to send lunch to everyone working with The Mission Continues, which is an organization that helps people in the Compton area of Los Angeles. So they sent a big lunch to them and they sent a really nice letter, which said, in honor of this day of service and in recognition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all that he stood for, we want to send our thanks and gratitude to the team at The Mission Continues. That's very nice. Very nice of them to send, you know, to lend a helping hand and, you know, to honor Martin Luther King, especially with everything they have going on. So it was nice of them to kind of reach out. Um, yeah. well, moving on to Duchess of Cornwall, she has been long known for her love of reading. And now she started an online reading group, the Duchess of Cornwall's Reading Room. Take a look. Hello and welcome to my reading room. To me, reading is a great adventure. I've loved it since I was very small and I would love everybody else to enjoy it as much as I do. You can escape and you can travel and you can laugh, you can cry. There's every kind of emotion that the human's experience is in a book. This is exciting for her. <laughs> yeah, I love this for her. It's yeah. great. I mean, why not? So yeah. she's got She's doing her first season is going to have four books. They mm -hmm. are The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantle, Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, Restless by William Boyd, and The Architect's Apprentice by Elif Shafak. Mm -hmm. So this sounds like a great project. It does. It sounds like a great project. And so we can all join her book, book club, all read the books, and kind of get in on the action, which is exciting. Yeah, there's never been a better time to read, especially if you've burned through all of Netflix, like most of us probably have. <laughs> like most of us, totally. So moving on to Sarah Fergie Ferguson. She opened up to Us Weekly about becoming a grandma, her relationship with Queen Elizabeth, and her tie to Bridgerton, which I thought was kind of interesting because it seems like if they do another season, they may be filming at a place very close to her. Her heart. <laughs> right. They might be filming at her and Prince Andrew's marital home, yes. Sunning Hill Park, which has not been in there. They privately owned it. It was mm -hmm. a privately bought um, wedding gift from the queen to them. It was pretty spectacular, gigantic house. I mean, if someone had given Meghan and Harry a similar house, I think people would have been irate, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> Seriously. So. Yeah, but so she, she said it was so good that she watched it twice. And she also did tell us that she has watched The Crown. Uh, she, uh, she said it was beautifully done, but uh, she didn't really say too much about um, this past season, but she was happy that they showed her wedding. So she also said that um, being the, the uh, daughter-in-law of the queen was one of her greatest honors. And she thinks that what the queen has done during this time has been um, amazing. So it seems like, you know, even though she's no longer part of the royal family marriage wise, it seems like she still has a good relationship. Right. And I wish that they would do a offshoot of the crown that's like a Fergie and Diana buddy <laughs> comedy because they just had a lot of fun in the 80s and I would love to see that dramatized. <laughs> totally. I would love to see that too. Well, I am absolutely loving the story. This is so great. Princess Margaret's grandson, Arthur Chato, is causing quite a stir on social media and people became obsessed with the 21-year-old after he posted some workout videos. Um, he is the, uh, the hot new royal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knew? He's a personal trainer. He's living in Scotland. He's at the University of Edinburgh. And he also holds a world record for youngest Olympic rower. Oh, who knew? <laughs> Multi-talented, this guy. He's got quite the, uh, quite the resume and quite the Instagram, which I think he probably has a lot of new followers over the past couple weeks. But yeah, yeah. so people are um, clamoring over him, you know, saying that he is a, a very good looking royal, which we'd have to agree. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, moving on to um, spilling the royalty. And there's a lot to, uh, to break down this week, especially on Harry and Meghan. So Finding Freedom author Omid Scobie recently opened up about their painful journey leaving the royal family you know he said you know it's so great that they have done so much in the past uh year that they've been gone but it wasn't always easy 
Right. Apparently they had a very rough time because they were moving around so frequently. Mm -hmm. Every time they moved, they felt a little more unmoored and their nanny quit, which had to have been really rough for them. Sure. (laughs) Because of COVID, you know, they just couldn't really have the year that they wanted to have, which I think we can all relate to. We can all relate to that. And Thomas Bradby, who's um, close with Harry and Meghan, he also said that Harry's been heartbroken about his family situation. He does believe that he's happy in California, but, you know, I'm sure not being able to see his family and with all the, you know, stories going around that there's still a rift between his brother, you know, it can't always be easy. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of negative attention that got placed on them this year when there's really nothing to do but look at the internet. But I mean, thankfully, they say they don't read any of their own press or social media comments. So I guess I hope so. (laughs) Hopefully they stuck to that this year. (laughs) Right. All right. Well, moving on to royal biographer Duncan Larcombe. Well, he opened up to ITV about how Harry and Meghan could be catastrophic to the royal family. Like this is These are some pretty uh, heavy words to use. Yeah, he said that they didn't actually want privacy. And something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is, did they ever say the words, we want more privacy? I don't know. We'd have to go back and look. I think they, you know, they just wanted, I think he did say that he wanted to lead a more private life. But I mean, in a way he is, I mean, he's not, I mean, you know, everybody's leaving more private life these days, so we don't really know how it would have been different, but you know, they are kind of doing things on their own terms. You know, they pick and choose what they want to do, what projects they want to be involved in. So in that case, yes, it is more private. I think, yeah, that's, it's another case of, you know, it's more so that they're controlling the narrative rather than necessarily getting more privacy. And yeah, they're suing the mail on Sunday for invasion of privacy, but it's just because that's like the legal term. I don't think they ever said we want to be private citizens is my point and like they and we're kind of everyone puts these words in their mouths I'm sure I've done it too and it's like they didn't really say they wanted to be private they just they're adults and they want to do their careers the way they want to do them right yeah that's really what it is right and he was saying you know it could be catastrophic for the royal family because you know, so much attention is going to go to Harry and Meghan when it should be going to Prince William if he does a royal engagement you know, and if they're talking about the same things, people might gravitate more towards Harry and Meghan rather right. than and, William. And it's like, is that their fault? I don't right. really think so. I don't so. think so. I mean, it's still, they're still tied to the royal family. It doesn't, I don't feel like it'll be catastrophic for either one of them. They're right. still, you know, shining a spotlight on similar things, but who knows? And, you know, Katie Nickel, who is a royal reporter, she also spoke to ITV and I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, she said, you know, how Prince Harry is using uh, Princess Diana's image and how that would sit with Prince William. And she thinks that, you know, William will kind of be concerned about that. Right. I mean, I think anything that sort of keeps Princess Diana's work top of mind is probably a good thing because it's important for people to remember her and everything. And I guess we'll just never really know how William actually feels about it. And I did think that their comments, both Katie and Duncan made comments about the fact that the two brothers are working on similar things like mental health and conservation. And it just really kind of makes me understand more why there is a rift because you can totally see that they just have different working styles. You know, one couple says, why can't we all do everything? It's we're a rising tide raises all ships. And the other couple is like, we think we're going to be more successful if we're strategic and we divide and conquer. So it's just two different ways of looking at it, I guess. And that's why they couldn't work together anymore. Yeah, but still delivering a similar message, which is important. All right, well, Meghan Markle's half-sister, Samantha Markle, is gearing up for her tell-all book, The Diary of Princess Cushy's Sister, Part One. And she recently opened up to Us Weekly about the upcoming book, you know, saying that it's going to show the good, the bad, and the ugly. And she knows she doesn't want this to be all negative. How could it not be negative? It's called the Diary of Princess Pushy's <laughs> Sister. This is like insane. It's like such a crazy level of gaslighting almost that I'm just like, do you know what the book is called? Right. Or are they putting it in the article afterwards so you don't see it? Like, seriously. And she's never minced words when it comes to Megan. They are not, uh, she is not her biggest fan. So I would imagine that this is not a um, a glowing, you know, look back at their childhood together and I don't think it's going to be, um, it's probably going to be more the bad and the ugly. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, also, how is it going to get through any legal department with any of the allegedly juicy details still intact? Unless it's something that Samantha can fully prove happened, it's going to be really hard to publish any of the 
dirt that she yeah. would want to publish. Totally. I think uh, maybe another lawsuit in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you going to read it, Christina? I mean, maybe I'll read the excerpts. I don't know if I would probably read the whole thing, but um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to believe what is true, what is not true, but I'm sure I'll give it a, a give it a glance. How about you? Yeah, I'm sure the excerpts are going to get plenty of yeah. runtime and sure I'll judge will. when I read those. Yeah. yeah, totally. Well, now it is time to break down the royal rules and this week we are going to take a look at Megan's ever-evolving fashion and to help us do that is Christine Ross, creative director of the blog Megan's Mirror. And before we get into her post-Sussex at style, how would you sum up the way that her style changed while she was within the royal family? I think it's been it's been so interesting to follow it because it really didn't change a lot. Mm -hmm. I like to say that it's kind of like she got a new job. You know, like if you get a if you have a job where it's business casual, you dress one way, and then all of a sudden it's really formal, and all of a sudden you wear kind of a different wardrobe. So when she entered the royal family, all of a sudden she was doing kind of more you know evening receptions and and uh, you know um, garden parties, and so that kind of required a different look. But what was fascinating was she really stuck to her own style. We saw a lot of structured details. We saw a lot of beautiful tailoring. We saw a lot of the same brands that she loved. So it was great to see her kind of take her pre-royal style and apply it to kind of her new role. Definitely. I mean, and we know that the royals have all of these guidelines and rules when it comes to fashion. I mean, do you have any insight onto how she may have felt about adhering to those rules? I think it's, like I said, it's kind of like a job interview when you start a new job and all of a sudden, you know, like you're expected to wear a jacket every day. I think it's just adjusting to the expectations of the role. And sometimes that maybe causes some friction. I, I know even with me where it's like, well, I don't want to wear that. <laughs> you know, I think it's very human to feel that way. But <clears throat> excuse me, she did a beautiful job of really kind of applying those expectations to her own style and to the role that she wanted to create. Mm -hmm. What were some of your personal favorite looks while she was in the royal family? Um, I think anytime she wore a hat, it was really exciting because there's definitely not enough hat opportunities anymore. But she always chose a really, really modern tailored look. You know, she didn't really go for like big floral headpieces. She kind of went for really structural sculpted pieces um, when she went for millinery. So it was really, really fun to see, again, just how she kind of adapted her very modern style to a traditional role. Yeah, and then when she left the royal family, did how did you expect her style to change? Obviously, we haven't gotten these big statement pieces because we've all been in quarantine, but how did you kind of expect her style to change? I think um, especially when they made the move back to Los Angeles, we kind of expected her to go back to that really down to earth LA style, which people love or readers really resonate with, you know, like the J. Crew blouses and things like that. And so I definitely expected, and what we saw is more jeans, more flats that you can run around town in, really down to earth style. She still has a very tailored aesthetic to her look. Um, it's still kind of clean lined, it's classic pieces, but so down to earth. It's something that you could wear to the grocery store because, you know, that's really what she's doing now is just living a very normal life. Totally. What do you think are some of her standout looks since she left the royal family? I think that that, um, that farewell tour she did, which I guess isn't technically after she left, but that farewell tour she did with the, the red gown, the green Amelia Wick said cape dress with that cape just flowing behind her. Those were just incredible, incredible looks. And then also, in, it's been interesting to see her Zoom calls when she's trying to, you know, on these um, more professional Zoom calls, because we've all been in lockdown. It's, it's been weird. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen such a beautiful professional look from her with these really, you know, these asymmetrical necklines or leather trousers, things like that, where even in those kind of low quality video conferences, you still see her true style. Mm -hmm. I mean, then how would you kind of sum up her, her true style versus her royal style then? I, you know, I think that really they were the, they were so similar. What people love about Megan is that she's always been true to her own style. I think she identified what she liked and what looked good on her really early on, even before she became a royal. She loves structure. She loves a monochromatic palette. She loves tailored pieces. She loves classic um, suiting and things like that. So even from before, during her more, you know, her more traditional royal lifestyle and after now that she's in LA, 
we're really seeing a lot of the same trends. And I think that's why people really like Megan because she's so true to her own style. So what do you think we can expect for Megan's style going forward? I think so much of it depends on how um, COVID changes over the next year, but I, I hope to see her more out and about. I think we would love to see her at some more, you know, public events, meeting people, because I think that's really where she shines is connecting with people. Um, and I would love to see her continue on this kind of accessible down to earth California girl path, because as the world has changed, there's not a lot of places for, you know, formal dresses and things like that. But there's apparently a lot of time for sweatpants and, and you know, jeans and comfortable clothes. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how her style evolves over the next year or so. Hopefully yes. we'll see a lot more fun looks, even though we'll be on Zooms. <laughs> um, all right, moving on to our Royal History Moment of the Week. And we are getting a very, very small inside glimpse at Kensington Palace. <laughs> yes, the Duke of Gloucester did a Zoom where we got to see some books behind him and his wife, the Duchess of Gloucester. We saw her desk and we saw some of those porcelain knickknacks mm -hmm. that everyone in the royal family loves. Yeah, we feel like we never get a look at at Kensington Palace. So this was kind of cool, even though it was just a little bookshelf and a desk, we do get a little glimpse inside. Yes. And it's wild to know how many people live there who I've just never even heard of before. It must be nice. Who knew? <laughs> Lots of neighbors. All right. Well, before we have to, before we wrap up, we have to check in on our royal kids, our pint-sized palace. And Kate and William gave us a glimpse of just one of the special pictures they have framed and prominently featured in their country home, country home at Amner Hall. Yes, it's so cute. It's George on his birthday, his sixth birthday. It was released in July 2019. He's missing a tooth. It's just the cutest picture of a future yes, thing probably ever. Totally. And we have seen this one before. So it's definitely adorable to see always what uh, knickknacks and photos they have in the background. And this was definitely a cute one on display. Yes, for sure. All right. Well, Molly, thank you for breaking down all things royals with me. Thank you, Christina. All right, for much more on the Royals, head on over to usmagazine.com and make sure you check back every Wednesday at 10.30 where we have got you covered.